In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of the changing role of man. Last time we left off with the Renaissance, and here we're going to pick up with mannerism and we're going to move through the Enlightenment. This will be this lecture. You're going to see the slides for modernism also, but I will add the lecture to those for next week and also, and I'll post it. Um, as the changing role of man part three and that'll be under next week so don't get confused when the audio stops yet there's still slides that's for next time so we left off last time with discussing the renaissance and we finished with Hans Holbein the Younger's piece the ambassadors and we talked about how that image that painting showed us all of those Renaissance ideals, yet still alluded to the fact that things were not perfect. We had things such as the broken strings on the lute showing discord and disharmony, the crucifix being covered up in the upper left-hand corner, and then most obviously was the anamorphous skull located in the center foreground, which was the memento mori reminding us all that death comes for us all, that death is the great equalizer. Well, what we're going to see now is we're going to continue this line where we're looking at how the role of man, how society was changing. And again, we're going to look at that through art. Well, what happens directly after the Renaissance, we have what's called mannerism. Mannerism is between the High Renaissance and the Baroque. It is a pretty short-lived movement, but it begins in 1527. And this is a pretty exact date. The reason why it's pretty exact is because in 1527, Rome, which was seen as the, the seat, the center of the High Renaissance, Rome was actually sacked by Spain. And what happens is you see this kind of questioning, this idea that, okay, as a society, we've been moving further and further away from the church. We've been turning more to man for the for the answers of the universe. Well, what happens after the sack of Rome is you start to have this questioning, this wondering if, well, is this the right thing? Are we going on the right path? Or with this traumatic event, should we actually turn back towards the church? And so we're gonna see a lot of this questioning of these Renaissance ideas. And this is reflected in the artworks of the time, especially in the painting. What we're going to see in mannerism is where in the High Renaissance we had those mathematically correct proportions in mannerism, very oddly proportioned forms. We're going to see lots of cool acid-like colors, silvers, browns, grays. We're going to see an abandonment of those classical ideas of balance and form. And the composition, you're going to see this imbalance and this instability and again, that's to reflect the political and social turmoil of the time. And you clearly see it in the work here. This is done by Parmagiano, uh, 1535 to 1540, and this is an oil on wood. And this is the Madonna of the Long Neck. So when we look at this artwork, if you look, this is supposed to be the Virgin Mary holding the baby Jesus. Yet when you look at this, this is dramatically different from other artworks we've looked at. Most obvious, look at Mary's neck. It's this long, almost swan-like neck. Very not realistic and not mathematically proportioned. Look at her fingers. They're almost snake-like fingers, long and thin. Um, Mary herself, look at her hips and her legs. If she stood up, she would probably look more like a bowling pin. And again, these odd proportions are all done on purpose. Look at the baby Jesus himself. Look at his legs. We know when a leg is smaller than the other, it's supposed to give us this idea that the back leg is further away. But look at those proportions. That front leg is huge and that back leg is tiny. Even if he stood up, right, he would almost topple over because he's so unbalanced. And even the size of the baby himself. The face and the head shows us almost a newborn, but the body could be that of maybe a two or three year old. Again, very odd within it. Then look at the figures over on the left. You see that one bare leg. Well, who does that leg belong to? We think it belongs to the angel whose face we see first, yet if you look at that, you see that leg, and then we see the neck and, and head appearing around the vase that she's holding. 
Well, if this is that individual's leg, think about how teeny, teeny, tiny the torso is. And then also look in the background. In the, well, the right foreground, we see at the bottom a smaller male. This is actually St. Jerome. Yet when you look at that, what do you think? Is that a real person or is that a small statue? If it's a real person, how far in the, in the distance does he have to be from Mary to, ma to make it make sense? Yet, look at that same column. In the back where the column is, in the bottom, it looks like it's actually close to Mary. But if that's the case, St. Jerome then can't be that far away in the distance. And then when we look at the column at the top, it looks as if it's very far away. So again, this very odd use of perspective, um, the colors that are used, very light grays, silvers, browns, these acid tones, very different from those that were used in the High Renaissance. And that we have, again, it's all reflecting these odd proportions. Um, the work itself is very imbalanced. If we cut it on its vertical axis, it would tip over to the left-hand side. Almost all the weight is on the left. And so this very different from the High Renaissance, and it was done very intentionally because, again, it's questioning those Renaissance ideals. It's wondering if we have perhaps moved too far away from the church and should we be going down the path that we are. However, this was actually more of a hiccup. And what we're going to see next is we're going to see what's called the Baroque. This starts circa about 1600 and it begins in Italy. And within it, we're going to see a return to more of those Renaissance ideals. Man himself is going to, um, we realize that maybe what happened in Rome with the sack of Rome and with mannerism, that that just seemed to be more of a hiccup in these ideas. And so we go back to focusing on man, man being responsible for not only creativity, but scientific exploration and discovery. Well, what we see in the Baroque, we do see these ideals, yet the Baroque is also distinctly different. Baroque art says that art should communicate and should have emotion, that works need to produce drama. How do we produce drama? Is through the tension, exuberance, opulence, and grandeur of the work. Artworks tend to have a very complex design, yet they are all still unified. And we're going to see this dramatic use of light and shade, or chiaroscuro. And we're going to see this very clearly in the works of probably the most famous of the Baroque painters, and that is Caravaggio. And you can see that in the work here. This is a crucifixion of St. Peter, um, 1601, and it's an oil on canvas. And what he's doing here is, again, we're seeing a biblical scene, right? This is the moment of St. Peter's crucifixion. He's being crucified upside down because he did not believe he was worthy enough to be crucified in the same way Christ was, and so he wants to be crucified upside down. Here, when you look at this, your eye probably goes directly to him. Why? Because the use of light, this very, very bright white cloth that he is in. It almost seems as if Peter himself is projecting the light. And then also the background that is used is very, very dark. If you think about this, this is a crucifixion. Where would this be taking place? It would be taking place outside. Yet is this a natural use of light that would, has, would be in that area? It's not. Caravaggio uses it to add the emotion, to add the drama to the work. Look at the three different individuals, right? We can't see any of their faces. Either they're turned away from us or they're in shadow. Think about this. When we turn away, when we hide our faces, why do we do this? Usually it's because we're doing something that we're ashamed of, that we don't want to be associated with us. And that, again, reflects the moment that Caravaggio chooses. Car the crucifixion of St. Peter could have been painted in many different ways. Yet think about this moment. What is happening? This is literally the moment they are hoisting him up. He's already been nailed to the cross. You can see that because of the nail sticking out of his left hand in the foreground. Yet this is that moment where literally he is being pulled up. We are in the middle of the action here. 
Caravaggio chooses this moment because it adds to the drama, adds to the emotion of the piece. And again, that is what the Baroque is about. And we can see this very clearly here in the three different sculptures. We've seen the other two and discussed them before. These all three are the same subject matter. We are all looking at sculptures of the Davids. But the first we see is Donatello's David, 1430 to 1440, from the early Renaissance. Remember the early Renaissance, the ideal was to show things as they actually were. So that's why here we see a younger, more feminized David, because the biblical story tells of David as a beautiful youth. And here that's what we see, Donatello showing David as the beautiful youth. And we also know the moment of the story. In this sculpture, David, we already know, is victorious. Why? Because he's standing on the severed head of Goliath. Now the middle work is Michelangelo's David from the High Renaissance, 1501 to 1504. Remember, the High Renaissance was about that mathematical portion, that ideal perfected body. And that's the David that we see here. Interestingly enough, the moment that this is in is simultaneously the moment before and the moment after the battle. Half the body is in tension, the moment before, we don't know who the winner is going to be, and the other half is more relaxed, showing us that we already know that this David is again victorious. Now look at the David on the right. This is Bernini's David of 1623, um, made from marble. And we see within this work, this represents the Baroque because of the emotion, the drama within the work. What moment does Bernini choose to, to portray? This is the moment where David is going to sling the stone. So his body, if you look at how twisted it is, is because he's twisted as far back as he can and he's getting ready to whip around and to release the stone. Again, this represents the Baroque because it's that grandeur, that opulence, that emotion. This is work almost has so much movement within it. In fact, when viewers go to see this, you can tell the trajectory that the rock is going to take, and people actually won't stand there because it seems so lifelike that he's going to whip around at any moment. Again, this is another sculpture by Bernini. This is the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And we see within here again that emotion, that opulent, that grandeur. Um, this was 1647 to 1652. It's a marble, and it's located in the Santa Maria della Victoria in Rome. And here there's two different images. The image on the left focuses on just the sculpture itself, but the image on the right shows you where it's actually located within the Santa Maria della Victoria. And this was all planned by Bernini. He designed the sculpture to be here. And here you can see that Baroque architecture, very ornate, highly decorated. Look in the pediments, look in the columns on top, uh, or the, the pediments on top of the uh, columns here in the capitals. And see how the scroll work, all the leaf work, yet it's still very organized and it's very systematic. If you cut this, it's symmetrical, because if you cut the architecture on the vertical axis, we folded it over, it's actually a mirror copy of itself. And then the golden rays behind it, those were also part of the original design. Nowadays, of course, we have electric lighting, but this was lit from this area above, so it's almost as if um, the lights are shining down on them. And that's what's intended, because what we see here is St. Teresa and an angel. And St. Teresa believed that there was no greater joy and no greater pain than knowing and feeling God's love. That it's simultaneously a moment of, of joy and of pain. She called it a moment of ecstasy. And there is nothing greater that humans can feel and experience. And that is what Bernini has decided to capture within this moment. That we see the angel, if you look in the angel's right hand, there's a golden arrow. And what has happened is the angel has just pierced St. Teresa in the heart. And the, the arrow represents God's love. And when you look at her face, right, this is a face depicting intense and moment. It's depicting that ecstasy. So this is a moment where she is showing, or Benini is showing, that St. Teresa is feeling that emotion, that ecstasy of it. And again, the Baroque focuses on this, on this drama. 
Next, we're going to move on into the, the Age of Reason, also known as the Enlightenment. What happens in this? this? We're looking at the 17th, 18th century. And what happens here is we have a literal remapping of the universe. Remember, before this time, it was believed that we lived in a geocentric universe, meaning that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything else revolved around the Earth. And this was a belief that was supported by the church. It was the idea that God had created wor the world in this way. Well, what happens is before there had been other people who had challenged this idea. In fact, Galileo was one of those. Um, Galileo actually spent the last years of his life in house arrest because he was charged with heresy, that he was going against the teachings of the church. Well, what happens in the Enlightenment is that it's actually scientifically, mathematically proven that this idea of the universe is incorrect and that we do live in what's called a heliocentric universe, meaning that the sun is the center of the known world and it's everything else that actually revolves around the sun. So this goes against the church teaching and it's proven that the church is incorrect. And so again, the age of reason, man moving even further and further away from the ideals of the church, looking more to science, science and reasoning for um, their knowledge. This is also the time of revolutions. We have the American Revolution, 1776, where the colonies separate themselves from the British rule and form a new country. From the American Revolution, we also get the French Revolution, this is where this is more of a class warfare and the lower classes of France, the lower middle classes, revolt and rebel against the king. They actually end up committing regicide, meaning Louis the, Louis the 16th uh, was guillotined along with his queen Marie Antoinette. And we see a new form of government that is established for a time. It's also a time of the scientific revolution, as I just discussed. More and more scientific advancements are being made. The scientific method that we still use today is put into effect at this time. And what the scientific method says is that we can't just believe things because this is how they've always been or how we've been told they are in the past, but it's through making a hypothesis and actual observation and scientific exploration to prove or disprove these hypotheses is how we can know and learn. This is also the time of the Industrial Revolution, that we are beginning to see the rise of factories. And with the factories, we're going to see a rise of a, of a consumer culture. Why? Because with factories, more things can be made quickly and they can be made cheaply, meaning they're more available for, uh, for consumers to buy them. We also, with the rise of the factories, you have to remember, most people up until this point lived an agrarian lifestyle, meaning most people were farmers. Well, when do you work as a farmer? Whenever you can, right? There's the saying, make hay while the sun shines, because you pretty much work from sun up till sundown, and then even after sundown, there's still work to do. Well, with the Industrial Revolution, with the rise of the factories, we now see a new working class where people were moving to cities to work in these factories. When you work in a factory, you work when you're scheduled to. Say you work nine to five. And so we're gonna see this shift in how we even looked at time. That instead of looking at time through sun time, we're gonna actually look at it through clock time. And that's still how our world is today. Think about how much of a slave to the clock we are. You're in class at a certain time. You have to be at work at a certain time. Well, this actually was a development that didn't happen until the 18th century. Um, also, this is going to be the time following the French Revolution. This is when Napoleon Bonaparte is going to come. Bonaparte is going to come to power, and we're going to see how the leadership and how the structure of the French government is again going to be changed. Well, what we're going to see in this is in, in the Enlightenment, we're going to see very two distinct art styles that are dealing with all of these changes. The first is what's called the Rococo. The Rococo focuses mainly in France, and it's mainly on the aristocracy, meaning the upper classes. And this is before the French Revolution. And what we're looking on is the Rococo, it's a reaction to the Baroque, the grandeur, and the symmetry. 
And it, what happens in the Rococo is it's much more playful. We're going to see this lightness in it, um, this gracefulness, and even the, in a satirized way, meaning they're almost poking fun at certain topics. And we see that in the works that we see here. This is Jean-Henri Frangard's, this is The Swing. And what happens in this, if you even just look at the subject matter, at first it just seems to be a woman on a swing. The colors are light and delicate. We see lots of soft blue, soft pinks, um, light white, more of the pastels. If you look at the brushwork in here, very light. We can see in the trees especially, we can see the brush strokes. Um, it's almost soft, almost um, fluffy, if you will. And again, this was all a reaction to the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution. But what's also interesting with the Rococo is it's also looking at subject matter that would not be deemed acceptable for public viewing. Because when we first look at this, we see a woman up on a swing and it looks playful. Yet, look from her, look to the bottom left foreground. Do you see somebody in the painting there? Yeah, there's a man hiding in the bushes. Is she aware that he is there? She clearly is, because if you follow her direct line of sight, she's looking right at him. So where before it looked like she was just playfully kicking up her leg and flipping off her shoe, think of what she's actually doing. The man in the, in the bushes is looking where? He's looking directly up her skirts to a view that she is actually giving him. And then look in the right foreground. Do you see back in the shadows? There's another man there and he's holding the ropes. This man is pushing her on the swing. So what do we actually have here? We have a woman who's being pushed on the swing by her husband, yet she's got her lover in the bushes in front of her. And so we see this very taboo topic discussed in the works of the Rococo. Um, other little interesting elements that add to this playfulness, between the woman and her husband, if you look, there's a statue of a couple of cherubs, and they clearly know from their expressions what's going on. And if you look at the sculpture on the left, it's another little cherub or an angel. And if you look, he's putting a finger up to his lips, almost as to say, shh, like don't tell. And he is directly above the lover. And so again, we see this, this playfulness. And it's a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution. Well, the other style that develops in the Enlightenment is the neoclassical or neoclassicalism. And what this does, this is the complete opposite of the Rococo. This is the early 18th century, 19th century. And this is a response to that Rococo style. What happens, even the name neoclassical, meaning the new classical, it's again looking back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but it's focusing more importantly on the themes meaning duty to country and duty to family first. In the paintings and the works, we're going to see central points being used where the Rococo was more open composition, the neoclassical was more closed composition, drawing our eyes to the center of the work. Very clean lines, we are going to see no evidence of brush strokes within the work. Um, in this painting here, this is Jacques-Louis David's The Oath of the Haradi, 1784, oil on canvas. And what we're seeing here, if you look at the architecture in the back, we have an arcade, which is a series of arches, and they're Roman arches. It's placed next to one another. And then the columns in these arches are actually Doric columns going back to the Greek architecture. And here we again, clean lines, we're going to see the return of the geometry in the works. You can see a triangle from the arms of the three men to the apex of the swords down the other man's arm. And then the group of women in the background, again, you see two smaller triangles. Well, what happens with this, even this subject matter, is dealing with the ideas of patriotism. And this represents a Roman myth, a Roman story of the Haradi family. And that's who we're looking at here. What happens is Rome is actually in a battle with a neighboring uh, city-state, Abalanga. And what is decided is instead of the battle to continuing between Rome and Abalanga, they ask the Haradi who have these three sons. They say, well, if your three sons will battle this other family from Abalanga with three sons, 
Whoever then wins, the city will be declared the winner. And this is the moment where the father asks the sons, are you willing to fight for your country? And of course, this is a moment where they say yes, and they are pledging that they will do what is best for Rome. On the right, you see the mother, um, the sisters, and the wives. The front two women is, one is a sister to the three brothers, and she's actually engaged to one of the brothers from Alba Longa. The other is a wife to one of the Haradi sons, and she's the sister to the three fighters from Alba Longa. And then in the background, we again see a mother and the small children. Well, what happens is this we can see in this painting that it's depicting this idea of loyalty, of patriotism, of duty to one's own country. Um, how the story continues is that they do go out and they battle, and the Haradi are um, victorious. However, two of the brothers are killed. All three of the brothers from Alba Longa are killed, and two of the three of the Haradi. But since one survives, he's declared the winner, and Rome is the winner. And when he came back to Rome, his sister, who remember was engaged to one of the other three brothers, actually curses Rome because of the death of her fiancé. Well, the brother, so enraged that she would talk about Rome that way, actually kills her also. And so again, we see these ideas of loyalty, of patriotism within the work. All right, the next couple um, artistic styles that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about very briefly. I just want to hit some of the main ideas. Next is what's called Romanticism. Romanticism is a reaction to all of the 18th century rationalism. And what happens in Romanticism is that we're going to see works shift from the neoclassical where we're not work worried about um, a realistic representation, but we're more interested in individualism, in freedom of expression, in emotion, and imagination. Now with romanticism, don't just think romantic love, right? The emotion is not just love. It's not puppies, kittens, hearts, and unicorns, but it's looking at um, the feelings that are evoked by a piece. And you're going to see that in a work such as the one here. This is Francisco de Goya's The Execution of the Citizens of Madrid, the 3rd of May, 1808. And this was painted in 1814. And it's an oil on canvas. And what we see here when we look at this painting, it's not trying to be a representational or realistic depiction of the events. Yet, it's actually showing the events that did happen. What happened was in Madrid, Napoleon's troops um, were attacking, and the people of Madrid fought against him on the May on May 2nd, and they did this in a guerrilla-style warfare. Well, on May 3rd, what the Napoleonic troops did in retaliation is that any of the Spanish hostages they had, they took them out and they executed them all. And this is the moment that de Goya has captured. Yet when you look here, it's not a realistic depiction. We clearly see the brush strokes. Um, the background, there's not a lot of detailing. Why? Because the focus is on the individuals. Here we see almost three moments within the same painting. We see the dead on the ground, the dying who are about to be shot, and the soon-to-be dead who are standing in line waiting to be executed. We see the French soldiers, the firing squad, lined up to kill the hostages, yet we don't see their faces because de Goya just wants to show them as faceless killing machines. Now, the figure in the center wearing the bright white shirt draws your eyes directly there, and he's got his arms thrown up in surrender, yet he's still about to be executed. And how he is, he's supposed to remind us as a Christ-like figure, but unlike Christ, who sacrificed his own life to save you know, the world, what happens here is this individual is giving up his own life, not because he wants to, but because the government is taking it away. Also, we see this is unrealistic because look at the source of light. There is one box lantern on the ground, yet how the painting is lit, this is the only light source, and this is an unnatural use of light. It would not provide this much light, nor in this way. Also, the firing squad itself, how close they are to the individuals. This is also not realistic. A firing squad would be much further away. Yet, why doesn't de Goya paint it that way? Because this way it's much more dramatic. Imagine pointing a gun at somebody, you know, 50 yards away, or pointing a gun at somebody two inches away. One's going to add more drama to the work. 
also very important to the Romantics was the role of nature. Again, we're coming from the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and where man is looking at nature more as a tool to be used and something to be controlled. Well, the Romantics have this idea of what's called the sublime, and it's the idea that nature is not something to be taken over and to be taken control. That nature is something man can use, but it's also something man needs to respect. And the idea of the sublime is standing in front of a force of nature and being terrified, that realizing you are absolutely powerless. And we're going to see this reflected in a lot of the works, that nature is something to be respected. And as I say, this is always your Jurassic Park moment, because nature will always find a way to come back. And we see that in works such as this one. This is J.M.W. Turner's um, The Slave Ship. And in this moment, we see, again, not worried about a realistic depiction. We see the ship in the background. Um, there's a typhoon approaching, meaning a horrible storm. Yet this is also kind of a play with this topic. Because the full name of this painting is actually Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying. It's from 1840, and it's an oil on canvas. And what the moment we're seeing here, this is a ship involved in the slave trade. And before they get to shore, they're throwing over the bodies of all the dead slaves. Because if the slave died, you could claim them on your insurance and get money for them. Well, if you get to port and you have six slaves, you still have to try to sell them. Well, a sixth slave is not going to be sold for much profit. And most of the times you would actually get more insurance money from claiming the slave died. So what happens in this practice is before they get to shore, they're throwing overboard the dead and the dying, the six slaves. And we see that their fate is they're obviously going to drown. If you look in the foreground, you can see all these hands and feet sticking out of the water, and we clearly still see the chains, the shackles that are on them. Now think about this. In reality, if these shackles were applied to you and you were thrown into the water, you would probably sink very quickly. So why did Turner portray them like this? Again, to add to the emotion of the piece, to show the horrors that these people were bound and then thrown into the water to die. You can also see in the right foreground the fish are attacking the people, eating them, and you see various birds, the seagulls, who are scavengers, also coming to eat on the soon-to-be-dead individuals. And so this idea, this painting, we again see the force of nature. We see the typhoon that is approaching, yet it's also a political comment on the role of nature of man, that this horrific practice, that obviously these slaves are not looked at as people or as individuals, they're just looked at property that is to be um, dealt with in the way that has the most profit for the slave owners. All right, um, the Romantic Ballet is also what we look at as the classical ballet. Please read this section in the, in the textbook. I'm really not going to talk about it much here, but the, the ballet actually shows us all of these ideas of romanticism. The focus of the Romantic Ballet is the ballerina. And she's supposed to be, it's the female, draped in soft tulle, light, graceful, dancing on point. However, while this seems very simplistic, very light, very graceful, ballet is very, very difficult, it's very technical, and it's actually very precise. In fact, this is why many athletes, um, boxers, uh, football players, especially your receivers, practice ballet because it teaches you to know and control all aspects of your body. So I want to make sure that you are reading this section, and I've provided two clips. The first is a clip to La Silphide um, from 1832, which was the most famous of the Romantic ballets. In here, what I want you to watch, you don't have to watch the whole clip, but pay attention to the ballerina and how lightful and graceful she appears, when in actuality this is technically very difficult to do. And then the second clip is just a short clip. Um, it's from Swan Lake, which was first popularized in 1877. And here what we see is you're going to see the black swan, and she is going to be performing the fouillettes, which are the quick whipping turns. And these are very popular to this day. And I add it on here so, again, you can see the technical difficulty within the work.
All right, next quickly is realism. This was in about the mid 19th century. And realism is exactly that. It's focusing on the reality of the world and it's trying to show the world as it actually is. And we see that in works such as Colbert's The Stonebreakers here. This is a type of social realism. Um, this is from 1849. And what happens with social realism is it's drawing attention to the everyday conditions of the working classes and the poor. Often it's a critique that, of what kept these individuals in the economic positions they are in in society. In theater and literature, again, showing life with brute honesty, showing that life is long and showing that life is hard. In the literature, you're going to see lots and lots of details because, again, describing the world as it is, and yet we're also going to look at these ideas of human nature, why people do the things that they do. Next, very quickly, aestheticism. Again, this is the 19th century, and this is simply the idea of art for art's sakes. Aestheticism claimed that art had no other purpose or meaning but to be beautiful, that it doesn't need to portray a political idea, it doesn't need to have a message, that it just simply needs to be beautiful. And Oscar Wilde was actually an artist um, who followed this idea. And in our very first lecture, the first quote you have was from Wilde where he said, all art is quite useless. And that's because of this idea of aestheticism, that art itself only has to be beautiful. And then very quickly, we're going to look at Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. What happens here with Impressionism? Uh, this is the 19th century, about the 1870s to the 1880s centered in France, and this was actually a very short-lived movement. And what happens with the Impressionists is that they were actually trying to capture a fleeting moment, the impression of a moment. So here we're going to see very short, quick brushstrokes. A lot of the Impressionists would actually go out and paint in nature. Um, before this time, most people would paint, they may go out and do sketches and stuff, but you would actually create your works back in your studio. Well, the Impressionists would actually take their canvases, their easels, and go out in the world to capture that fleeting moment, that impression. And you see that here. This is uh, Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise from 1872. And this is actually the work that the movement got its name from. An art critic said, um, was critiquing this and he's like this isn't a sunrise it's this the impression of a sunrise and the impressionists were like yes thank you that's actually what we're trying to do with the work and again they're not trying to capture the world in all its realities and details but just that fleeting moment the impressionist paintings are usually small usually they have bright colors the composition is casual and natural and the play of light is very very important and we're going to see this in the different studies so like if you look at Monet's different water lilies the same place the same water lilies are painted over and over and over again yet they're painted at different times a day to capture that light and how the light itself can affect the work and then we're going to look at post-impressionism Post-Impressionism evolves from Impressionism, usually the same subject matter, um, the subject matter of Impressionism, usually looking at what's called the middle classes, but these were the pretty well-to-do middle classes, looking at that happy life, if you will. But what happens in post-Impressionism is that you're going to see a desire to make the works more precise. And what's interesting, post-impressionism does this in a variety of ways. We're going to see works such as this one here. This is Seurat's um, Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte, 1884 to 1886. And this is what's done with a style called pointillism. This work is actually very, very large. It's about 10 feet by 12 feet roughly. And it's painted... Pointillism is done very, very painstakingly, meaning each little drop of paint is applied with the tip of the paintbrush. If you look at this closely, even areas that seem to be solid color fields are not. They're made up these tiny, tiny, tiny little points of paint. 
Um, also in post-impressionism, we're going to see a flattening of the canvas, meaning the works are going to be much more two-dimensional. Um, in some of the works, we'll see outlining come back in. There was no outlining in impressionism. Um, I have a, put a little film clip for you here. This painting very famously is in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, it's in the Museum of Art in Chicago. Um, but what you can see, watch this little clip here. What I want you to pay attention to is as Cameron is standing in front of it, he's almost mesmerized by the painting, but they keep going closer and closer and closer in. And as they do so, you can see each of these tiny little dots. So that's what I want you to look at. And then the final piece we're going to look at in the post-impressionist, this is by Paul Cezanne. And Cezanne is actually considered the father of modern art. What he would do in his paintings, again, you see that flattening of the canvas, and what he would do is he would break his images down to what he called their basis form, right, the base element, which he saw as little geometric, shape, geometric shapes or little planes. And so when you see here, this is that we're looking at um, the, view from, the view from the large pine tree of Saint, Saint, Mount St. Victoria. And when you look at this, this is a landscape, yet look at the, the countryside, the houses. They're almost little squares, little triangles, little, little rectangles. And that is what he is doing in the work. He's breaking it down into a much more scientific form than the Impressionists were doing. And again, this idea of the art breaking it down into these small little planes, this is actually going to influence a lot of the modernistic styles that we'll look at next time, including and most especially um, Cubism. So that is a quick run through of where we are up until this moment. Again, pay attention to how the role of man has changed, what developments have happened in culture, and how the artworks of the time have reflected this.